I'll be teaching tonight for 40 minutes. My goal in this conference, like I said from last night, is not just for the things the Lord will be doing in this auditorium. The Lord is out to raise for himself an army that can bear the burdens in the heart of the Father and bring witness to territories, to systems, and to institutions so that the eternal agenda of God for our generation will be witnessed sufficiently. And when we gather like this, it's a summon. It becomes a ground of recruitment for warriors and functionaries that will bring witness at that level. So the emphasis is not just what happens in the auditorium. I say it oftentimes, we don't need a healing service to heal the sick. We can heal the sick in the market, in the office, and every time we gather. But when we call for a holy convergence like this, it means beyond healings, there is a definite spiritual reality and investment that God wants to commit to faithful men. So they will leave that meeting and become an extension of that reality. This is why convergences like this become very important. Because it gives us an opportunity to receive things that we would not have been able to receive praying in our bedrooms and having fellowship with the Lord. And the first thing God will do tonight after my teaching is to bring impartations that will provoke different levels of empowerment for different levels of witnesses territorially by the name of the Lord. So, just to recap some of the things I shared yesterday before I begin tonight, we tagged this conference by the leading of the Holy Spirit, the Ascended Conference. And thank God, so many beautiful ministers of the Lord have shared from different perspectives and brought different witnesses. You know, in the spirit, we are clothed with strange realities. You know, because we are created in the image of God, our operation is of the God class. So when we come for meetings like this, sometimes the reason why we bring up different ministers to minister is because our witnesses are not the same. The Bible said the Lord is clothed with Christus, Jasper, and Sardine. And what Christus do is that they reflect light because God is light and in him is no darkness. So what Christus do is that they reflect light at different angles, at different intensities, and at different illumination. So when God has a witness for a territory, most times he brings his servants to reflect the different kinds of light that they represent. So that at the end of the day, the quorum of witness is complete. So when a prophet comes up, there is a dimension of light that he brings to complete the quorum. So that the weight of witness will have the stature to deal with territorial matters. When a teacher comes up, there is a kind of witness he brings. When an intercessor comes up, there is a kind of witness he brings. That's why he said, him that descended is the same that ascended on high. And he gave gifts unto men. He said to some, he gave to be apostles. To some, he gave to be prophets. To some, he gave to be evangelists. To some, he gave to be pastors and teachers for the perfecting. The word perfecting is the word katadismos. It means to equip with light. So everyone brings a different blend of witness. So that at the end of the day, when we leave the meeting, we will sustain the stature that is required to bring territorial witness and governance. This is why many people have come to bring their own witnesses. And I have brought a little out of the many spectrum 
of witnesses that different apostles, prophets, and teachers have brought in the course of this meeting. So my rounding up tonight is not because I am more grounded than anyone. It's just because my own addition must be brought on the table so that the quorum of witness can be complete. Are we together? I said that to prepare your hearts. So when you hear me speak, you wouldn't take what I said to contradict what another person has said. And you wouldn't take what I said to be the witness of God as against what somebody else has said. If somebody else came up and just said, God bless you, that's part of the quorum of witness. Are we together? Praise the Lord. So last night I began to build. And I said, the ascended conference is not a conference of men. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3, Paul said, if there is argument among you, if there is malice among you, if there is backbiting amongst you, he said, are you not carnal? Are you not babes? Do you not behave like men? That means there is a realm where God has prepared us to walk. There is a class God has ordained for us to walk. It's not the class of men. It's actually the class of gods. So I began sharing yesterday that when God created man, before he gave him the title of man, he revealed to us what the essence of this being was. Because this being he called man, there was a way he created him. And in Genesis 1.26, he said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness. So, the being that God created was created to carry the essence of God and to function in the class of God. And I told us the reason God called him man was because he wanted to hide him in the visible realm. Because the word man means ish is a species of being. And that species is of the God class. It's not even male. That's why he said he made them male and female. So man is not male. Man is not female. Man is a species that carries the DNA of God and expected to walk in the class of God. The reason they call us humans is because we the word is humus man. It means we are men that are hid in dust. But the reason we are hid in dust is because God wanted us to function in the natural realm. So this body gives us the right and the legality to function here. But we are not of this world. And that's why I shared with us yesterday that this visage we carry, we are not the first to bear it. Because before God created Adam, there was another being in the throne room that carries this image that we carry. Because the Bible said, the four beasts, it said one of the faces they have is this kind of face that we carry. But you see, they didn't have a name at that time. So they called them the living creatures. So one of the living creatures already carries this visage that we carry. Because one of the living creatures already looked like God. But that one did not have license to function on the earth. When that species was created, he was created to function in the throne room. So when God created another being that had the same face that one of the living creatures had and decided to put him on earth in order not to contradict between the one in the throne room and the one on earth, he gave a name to the one on earth that they didn't need to turn. The Bible said any direction God moves, they just move in that direction because they were functioning at the speed and at the frequency of God. So when God created this other species with that same image, he put him on the earth. He expected him to function exactly like himself. So the man 
is actually created to live and to operate like a God. So in an ascended conference like this, we come to remind ourselves that we are not mere men. We come to remind ourselves that even if you are the best among men, it's not good enough. We come to remind ourselves that the only accepted order of operation is the God order. So anything that is not exactly like God is not accepted because you were created to function in that order. That's why the psalmist, when he was granted access by the prophetic anointing into the realm of the spirit, he began to speak from Psalm 82 from verse 5. He said, ye are gods because you are the children of the most high God. That means you carry the DNA of Abba. And he said, but you know not, neither will you understand. So they walk on in darkness. Hence, he said, they will fall like one of the princes. But when Jesus came in John chapter 10 verse 34, he said, if it is said unto you that ye are gods, unto whom the word of the Lord came, and the scriptures cannot be broken, why sayest thou that I blaspheme calling myself God because the human race had diminished in understanding to a point that men were afraid of saying they could function in the realm of God. So when Jesus came and said he was God, they wanted to stone him. And Jesus was wondering, why is this strange to you? Was it not you that the scriptures told that you are God? And are you not aware that the scriptures cannot be broken? Why are you shocked that I say I'm a God? I am one like unto you. I'm a man like you. And men were created to function as God. Why are you like this? What has happened to you? It's because of what the psalmist said. They know not. Neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. But certain men began to understand it. That's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3.3 3, that you shouldn't walk like a mere man. That you are not a man. You are a God man. You are expected to function in the class of God. So I said to walk in the class of God. There were certain criteria. And the first I said, you have to receive the life of God. The moment you receive the life of God, you have shifted from the class of men to the class of God. When Paul was writing in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, he didn't, he was careful not to say it. Because you know, he had already told the Corinthian church that they were carnal. So he couldn't say, You are gods. Because if I tell you what you really are, you will stone me. So let's just call you a new creation. Whatever you discover that new creation to be by your own revelation, walk in it. So some will discover that they are men, they will function in the class of men. But whoever discovers that he was ordained to function in the class of God, will begin to walk there. That's why Jesus sent the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost came to teach you how to live as a God. Because you have lived as a man for too long. So no man could teach you. That's why he said you have an unction from the Holy Ghost. No man can teach you how to function as a God. So a God himself has to become your teacher. So when you are born again, you are introduced back into the God class. And I said, now that you have received the life of God, there is something that will want to fight you from functioning there. The summation of that thing is called flesh. So the psalmist, you know, the kind of understanding David had, if David was in the New Testament, he would have been prolific like Paul. And maybe he would have even functioned at a higher realm than Paul. Because the things David knew and altered in the Old Testament were mind-blowing. And David began to teach us how to function in ascended reality. And he said, who shall stand upon the mountains of God? Who shall ascend to his holy hills? He said, him that is of a pure heart. Him that his hands are clean. Him who has not lifted up his soul in vanity. Remember, when Adam was in the garden, he was already in the image and the likeness of God. But the serpent came and told him that if you want to be like God, 
eat of the fruit that God asked you not to eat. The guy was already a God. But the devil wanted to provoke the tendencies of flesh out of him. So the moment the man begins to function by the flesh, he descends from the realm of God. So the devil actually taught him how to descend from the realm of God. He was already a God, functioning in the image and the likeness of God. But the moment his soul was lifted in vanity, he fell. So David was teaching us that the way to ascend back to the God realm is to make sure that your heart is not darkened, to make sure that your hands are clean, and to make sure that your soul is not lifted in vanity. He said, the moment you are able to do this, then you will stand on the mountains of God. So I told us yesterday that most of the spiritual activities we do to mortify the flesh, if we don't understand that the goal is to mortify flesh so that we can walk in our reality, where we take pride in the vanity of this life. So somebody can be carrying out an activity as sacred as prayer, but his goal is either to make people know that he's a prayer warrior, or his goal is to pray for a particular period of time and brag with it, or his goal is to carry out certain gesticulation in prayer. Have you seen pictures of prayer meetings in recent time? You will discover that, oh, they've lost the purpose of this thing. What is supposed to transport them to an ascended reality? They have made a fleshly show out of it. So people are praying, they are carrying cheer up. People are praying, they want to disfigure themselves. Why? Because the picture will be on Facebook. And when you see them like that, you say, wow, these are men of prayer. These are men of prayer. And we keep praying and remain descended. Because we don't know that the key to ascension is not just prayer. The key to ascension is a prayer that mortifies the flesh. Because what keeps you descended is an evil heart, is an impure hand, and is a soul that is lifted in vanity. Most times, we know the best things to say, but when you come close to our personal life, you will discover that we are far from what we preach. Most of the kingdom preachers today, they know all the laws of the kingdom, all the principles of the kingdom, but when you come close, you will discover the kingdom is not in view. It's just because the kingdom message is the most marketable message. So anybody who preaches the kingdom message will be perceived as a right man of God. But when you come around our cycle, like Paul has said, in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 3 and 4, he said, we know all mysteries. We have all utterance. We don't come behind in any gift. He said, but there is backbiting. There is malice. There is all kinds of darkness in the heart. He said, you are babes. You are men, men. You can teach the best of mystery, but if the heart is darkened, you can't function in ascended reality. In recent times, I saw some things that scared me. The things I heard that made me thought there were special kinds of messengers. When I got close, I discovered we were good, mess we, we were good with messages. But the heart is not right. So even though we say big things, the kind of witness that should follow what we do is not there. Because angels cannot be deceived. The Holy Ghost cannot be deceived. The spirit realm cannot be deceived. That's why you hear all the mysteries. But one deaf ear is not opening. One blind eye is not opening. We speak over territories, nothing is happening. We preach the kingdom, we talk about it, but we can't see any takeover. The key is to come to the place where flesh is dealt with. It's not a message, it's a life. Because men can hear it and call us men of stature, but our results itself will prove that we lie. Because I've seen many men of stature that cannot talk to broken bones and they are mended. I've seen many men of stature that cannot command blind eyes to open. I've seen many men of stature that prophesied a lot of things we end, they didn't end. I've seen many men of stature that decreed over territories and nothing happened. Meanwhile, in the scriptures, I saw men who didn't know mysteries, but they stood up and said, let the sun stand upon the mountains of Ajalo. Let the moon remain upon the valley of Gibeon. And the Bible said the sun did not make haste to go down. Neither the moon went down. It said in the day that God hearkened to the voice of a man. 
their stature was not revealed by the mysteries they preached. Their stature was revealed by the degree that the spirit realm attended to their words. Unless they don't speak. The Bible said in the days of Samuel, the walls of Samuel never fell to the ground. And he said so long as Samuel lived, the hand of God was perpetually against the Philistines. Perpetually. How come we have all the men of stature, yet the hand of God is not against our enemy? Because there is something wrong with the heart. So Paul said to walk in ascended reality is beyond the message. Because the spirit realm will bear witness and they will give credibility to the life, not the message. I'm saying the lowest way to show that you have stature is the ability to rule in the demonic realm. And if a demon is holding something captive and you cannot deal with it, then what is the definition of your stature? Something is wrong. And I'm not saying this to make you feel that man manifestation is the validation of what we do. I'm telling you this so that you begin to check your heart. Before you receive the impartation, find out who have you kept grudge against? While you are yet preaching the best kingdom message. Who have you kept malice against? Who have you killed with your tongue? While you are yet preaching the kingdom message. You cannot change anything in the generation. Because David said, who will stand upon the mountain of God? Who will stand upon his holy hills? It is a man that is of a clean heart, of a pure hand. And who has not lifted up his soul in vanity. If that has not been dealt with, we can never function in the ascended reality. Number three, I said to walk in the ascended reality is when we begin to hear summons from heaven. And I said the first kind of summons that we hear are sounds. Nobody ascends without sound in this kingdom. You can never do it. You must hear something from the spirit realm. Something must speak to you. A sound must come to your spirit. Because sounds are vehicle of transport in the spirit. So he said, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were together in one accord, and they heard a sound from heaven as of a strong, mighty wind. In Revelation chapter 1 from verse 9, he said, I, your brother John, in tribulation, I was, I was in the spirit on the last day, and I heard a sound as of a trumpet. A sound as of a trumpet, and as I turned. So sounds escort us into the throne room. He said concerning Elijah that a sound came from heaven with a whirlwind and a chariot of fire and the whirlwind took him up. There are things that must be heard. There are things that must be heard that is not in the, earth of, the earthly realm for us to function in the celestial realm. And I said number two, there are things we must see. There are disclosures that if they don't come to you, you will struggle for a long time. Many times, when your heart becomes pure, you will discover that the spirit realm opens up to you. You begin to see things that you didn't pray for. You begin to see things that you didn't bargain for. God can come to you and tell you, this is the map of Abuja. Do this, do this, do this. And you will be functioning from the place of rest because you have seen. That's why he said, the things we have seen and heard are the things we declare unto you. We don't just come to speak. We come to speak because we've seen things. We have heard things. But for you to ascend to a point where spiritual realities are open to you, your heart must be perfected. Your soul must come down in humility and your hand must be pure. We have many people talking who have not heard or seen anything. This is why our messages are sound and intelligent. Yet, we cannot contend with the darkness in our territory. Something is wrong. To function in that realm. These realities begin to happen to you. 
they are not even things you bargain for. Sometimes the Holy Ghost just summon you to the place of prayer. And then you find yourself praying for days, for weeks. Not because you have a need, but as you are praying, you discover a point comes where the realm beyond your realm become more real to you. When you come out of that place, you will notice that naturally, the things that interest men of this realm no longer interest you. I've experienced these things a couple of times. So I know what I'm telling you. Sometimes you engage a lengthy fast and prayer and then you come out. When people are gossiping people, it looks as if they are piercing you with needles. You can't participate in it. You run away. Sometimes you come out when people are just talking aimlessly. Not even because they are saying anything bad. You just see the vanity in their conversation. It begins to choke you. You step aside. But after a while, you discover that you descend back to that realm. And when you relate with them for a long time, that becomes your own disposition. It becomes even difficult for you to ascend again because you have been encompassed and engulfed with the lifestyle of this realm. So there is a someone that men must come up here in order to be able to function in the God class because that is their ordination. This were the emphasis the Lord gave us last night. And tonight, God wants me to build a little more on some of the things that he's put in my heart to share. And the first thing God wants me to talk about tonight is how to constantly sustain an ascended disposition. Because when you come up to an ascended disposition, you can descend again. You can descend again. And I know most of you have experienced it again and again and again. It's possible to descend from an ascended reality. If certain cultures and spiritual lifestyle are not sustained and kept, you will find yourself descending over and over and over again. So there is a way to sustain the ascended life. And the first way to sustain the ascended life is to constantly bear the consciousness of who you are in Christ. Constantly carrying the consciousness of who you are in Christ. One thing the world system wants to do to you is to make you feel that those things are a lie. Is to make you feel as though this is your true reality. So you are not careful. You begin to define yourself by the experiences around your life. This may be very simple, but this is why many people fall and are ensnared in their lives. They come to a point where they feel it is natural for them to be sick. So when you tell them we shouldn't be sick, they say, oh, now don't come again. When you tell them it's possible to live without sin, they say no man is perfect. When you tell them it's possible to live constantly in abundance, they say, Habba, this life is up and down. How can you talk like this? And they think they are just talking. But what they don't know is that in Isaiah chapter 43 verse 26, he said, keep me in remembrance of my word. He said, declare thou that thou mightest be justified. It is your consciousness that determines your experience. If you don't sustain the consciousness of the fact that you are of the God class, not too long, you will fall back into the realm of men and you will start struggling in the flesh and it will become impossible. Look at how God behaves. In Genesis chapter 1, the Bible said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The heavens and the earth created was perfect. But suddenly God came back and he said the earth was dark. He said darkness was upon the face of the deep. If we think for a second that God will now become conscious of the darkness, the Bible said God did not make the darkness his reality. He said the spirit of God brooded upon the face of the deep. And the first time God spoke, he never mentioned darkness. He said, let there be light. The word means light appear. That means God remained in the ascended state where he was, where he created the heavens and the earth. Even though darkness has filled everywhere, it had nothing to do with God. The reason you know there was darkness on the face of the earth was because Moses called darkness. If you hear every time God said, God said, 
He never mentioned the chaos. God kept his consciousness intact. I am creator. I only say what I want to see. And what God wanted to see was what God was conscious of. Light appear. And he said light appeared. God moved. He said everything was in chaos. But God said what he brooded. And what he brooded became his reality. Many times because we don't know that the consciousness we sustain is what determines our outcome. We fall down from the realm where God has put us. Jesus said as the living father has life in himself. So has he given to the son to have life in himself also. And he has committed all judgment to the son. So the reason Jesus had power to execute judgment was because he remained in the realm of life. People were dying around him. Things were going wrong around him. But he remained in the realm of life. Every time Jesus spoke, they call it blasphemy. Because he remained in the realm of God. How many times have you said the things that society taught you? That's why even though you are born again, you carry the word system into the kingdom. He said, let no man in Zion say, I am sick. How many times have you said you are sick? That's why every day you are looking for somebody to pray for you. If you will only carry the consciousness that in this kingdom we don't fall sick, you will be amazed how that consciousness will impact your life. Because let no man in Zion say, I am sick. Does this mean you deny fact? No. It simply means you refuse fact from dominating you. You refuse fact from dominating you. Many times, our confessions are a testimony of our consciousness. And all our confessions are always in the negative direction. You will never hear a God man speak like that. We don't talk like that. There is a way we talk because there is a consciousness we have. When you begin, it may look very dry and dull. But when you continue for a while, you will discover that your word can culture your system. Because the walls were framed by the word of God. And the things which are were not made out of the things we do appear. If Christians will be taught how to sustain the consciousness of who they are, their lives will remain upward and forward only. The Bible said, it said the path of the just is as a shiny light that shines brighter and brighter unto the perfect day. But if you tell somebody today that you have only been making progress, they'll say you are a liar. I heard Bishop Oedeko said something. He said since he got married, he had not had crisis in his family. And then people say, Haba, it's a lie. How can it be? Because people talk as men. Because you have problem, does it mean everybody must have problem? There is a consciousness one man has, and it has changed everything about his life. The outcome of your life is a product of your consciousness. So the Holy Ghost is telling us tonight that the only way to sustain the ascended reality is not just to accept it, but to make it your consciousness. He said, whoever is born of God overcometh the world. How can sickness overcome you? He said, whoever is born of God overcometh the world. How can Abuja overcome you? Whoever is born of God overcometh the world. How can the business world overcome you? How can the media overcome you? We come there not just to succeed. We come to take over. Today, when you start making progress, they say you are in a rush. Where are you running to? Run. Run. In the class of God, at the age of 12, a little boy knew more than a professor. I am above 30. You tell me I'm running. No, you want to dwarf me. In the realm of God, success is not what determines our parameters because we command them to happen. It is a byproduct. Who we are is what determines our outcome. I've not even started. You say I'm in a rush. I'm already late. I'm already late. I should be parking stadia for Jesus. I'm still doing meeting in the auditorium and you are telling me I'm in a rush. Every time they spoke about Jesus, he said a great multitude followed him. You are not permitted to have a small meeting. It's an error to have a small meeting because the realm where you function, only great multitude follow us. How can you be having a meeting? The hall is not even full. You say you are in a rush. We have not started. We are actually very slow. Because when the hand of God came upon Elijah, the Bible said he outran, he outran the chariot of Ahab. It was Bishop Abiyo that was preaching a few days ago in Dunamis. He said, some will tell you, don't kill yourself. Kill what? 
don't kill myself. I'm already dying, not doing anything. You say, don't kill yourself. You have not started. You are 25 and you don't know what to do. And they say you are too zealous because you are going to church every day. No. Who says going to church? You should have pioneered five churches. And they are saying you are going to church every day. You want to kill yourself. You should have pioneered five churches. How come you are a choir member for five years? And then you are still singing. And at this level you are competing that you are the one that led the song. On miracle service. Led which song? Your, your voice now should be downloading dimensions of heaven into the earth realm. You have been in choir for five years. And all you have are rehearsals. You have not started. You are actually failing. Because good enough is not enough. Only God enough is enough. But it begins with consciousness. How can you keep 30 pastors for three years? In one conference, 30 pastors are gathered. And there is no gospel in Sokoto. There is nobody doing revival campaigns in Kaduna. There is nobody doing revival campaigns in Lagos. And then we are 30 in one hall. It's already a big body. That we came for this meeting and there are five prophets. There are three apostles. There are seven teachers in one meeting. No! This Sunday, how many Sundays do we have in a year? We have only 52 Sundays. How come 30 ministers can gather in one place on Sunday when you have only 52 Sundays in a year? One of us is enough for this meeting. One of us will come here and blow this place on fire. And those who are living here, they will say, no Sunday we can't be sitting down. How can 30 ministers be in one convocation? And it's not a minister's conference. No, it's a waste of time. It's a waste of time because there are too many dark territories. But our consciousness is wrong. So when we do so little, we say we have done enough. I heard what Robert Leadon said and it blew my head. He said in 1985, Ami Semper McPherson built an auditorium of 55,000. And in six months, she had three services every day for six months. And all of them were miracle services. And he showed us a picture, a stretcher service. A service that was not, you are a normal Christian, you are healthy, you are not allowed. Only people of stretchers were invited. And woman of God came out. That day was not day of preaching. It was day of demonstration. It was day of demonstration. Somebody did that in 1985. And I'm calling myself an apostle now. And I come for a meeting. One person is crippled. And I'm saying, let's trust God for her healing. Meanwhile, in 1985, somebody is already organizing stretchers meeting. That's somebody who understood what it meant to be a God. Sweet so Wigglesworth was all raising dead men over five decades ago. Until today, I have not raised one. And I say I'm an apostle. And I brag because I came for a meeting. Somebody fell under the power. No, my consciousness is wrong. My consciousness is wrong. Because the man before you, if he raised 10, you are no longer permitted to raise 10. If you raise less than 11, you have already failed. It means you didn't follow the progression of spiritual reality. Jesus raised 3. Smith Wiggles word raised 28. You should raise 30. That's the consciousness we should carry. We have not started anything, but because of our pride and ego, we think we have done so much. Done so much. Done so much. Done so much. Even the fathers that are still alive today, they are gathering people in millions. Millions. They sit down, they are talking. Deaf ears are opening. Blind eyes are opening. And we say, we have done what? We have not done anything. Until we surpass their record. We have not started. I heard that Pastor Chris went to Ghana. And when he came to Ghana, they, they were to use the Black Star, the Black Star Square. That's what they call it. And across the road was the National Stadium. And across the other road was the National Theater. The Black Star Square could seat 50,000 people. The National Stadium could seat at about 50,000. The National Theater also six thousand, and every Christ Embassy Church in Ghana was packed. He came out before he started talking. Four cripples rose up from which year, and then I go to Ghana, and people are in one auditorium, and then I deceive myself and say, "Crowd came. Which crowd? Which crowd? Crowd came where? In one auditorium, 
when somebody in your generation went to the same city, three stadium-like buildings were packed, churches were packed, cripples were walking without him praying. Do you know why I wear white suit? I remind myself every day that I've not started. So that when the things that happen with them don't happen with me, I will know I made a caricature of myself. Because we have not started. And then somebody comes to talk that you are happy. That you said you went to Ghana, crowd came. Crowd? Which crowd? If one man packed the stadium until I'm going to that city and they declare a public holiday, I've not started. What are you doing? In Nigeria here, here at Deboye sits down in Holy Ghost service and nine million people gather and then you organize a meeting. You say you have started. No, we are still doing rehearsals. It's a consciousness. Yet yeah, these men are not tired. Every time you ask them, they say they've not begun. And meanwhile, our own generation, we are still crawling. And we say we have done so much. And we become so proud and high-minded. The angels will wonder, what kind of generation is this? The people who are yet ahead of you, they are doing so much. And you say you have started. Three days ago, I strolled into the vigil in Dunamis. Just to be blessed. Because it's a minister's flaming and fire conference. Lo and behold, I came for a VG and I saw close to 10,000 cars. When I entered the auditorium around 12 midnight, 100,000 auditorium was packed. I said, What? In a VG? In Abuja here? We need to repent because our consciousness is wrong. Our consciousness is wrong. Our consciousness is wrong. So wrong that something urgent must be done. To walk in the God life, we must carry the consciousness of God. Jesus didn't say, go see a doctor. Thank God for medical science. I endorse it. If your faith has not been built, appreciate it, use it. But Jesus said, lay hands on the sick, they will recover. And when I checked Jesus, he was never sick. Jesus, everywhere he went, the Bible said multitudes followed him. So if multitudes have never begun following you, you have not started. As far as I knew, Jesus never recognized any obstacle. The Bible said the disciples went ahead of him. The boast was gone over three hours before. Jesus didn't call Peter and say, why did you live here without telling me? The man walked in water and he strolled and moved faster than the boat and met them. And the Bible said the moment he entered the boat, the same speed he carried that he almost overtook the boat, he added it to the boat and the boat was at shore. The moment he stepped into the boat, how can I touch a business and it fails? If it was failing before I came, it will start working. Everything I touch will prosper. Everything I do work. And it doesn't just work. It works with an extraordinary speed. So I don't care how many years it took you to do it. You may have done it in five years. You may have done it in 10 years. You may have done it in 20 years. As far as I'm concerned, weeping may endure for the night. Joy comes in the morning. Our light affliction are but for the moment. They work for us an exceeding weight of glory. I don't care if it took you 20 years. When I come, I come with speed. When I come, I come with possibilities. And it must not happen to me the way it happened to you. It's a consciousness of the God kind of people. Everybody with a clutch, lift it up. No prayer. 
start coming forward. What? Lift up your crutch and start coming forward. No prayer. And then it's not one. It's not two. It's not three. It's not ten. It's not fifteen. Sometimes twenty-five. Thirty. Start walking towards him. And he said, drop it here. He walks up to everybody on which here. He said, get up. Jesus makes you whole. No prayer. Why? Because a God was standing before sickness. Sickness will bow. A God, a man that rules in the demonic realm was standing. Whatever that demon was, if you like, bend the leg. The leg was straight. Because the one talking, he rules in the demonic realm. Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. There are certain men that anything done by demons, just wait for them to appear. When they appear, it will correct itself. I watched a man called Chris Oyakilome. Fathers, he walked into a healing service. And there is no prayer. There is no thank you, Father. He just begins to point at people. And demons go out. Cripples walk. He finished from there. You think, okay, maybe it's because the his headache. And then when he finished, to clear your doubt, he now walks up to the session of those who are witches. And then he begins to lift them up as if they were tired. People who has not walked for 10 years, for 20 years, he lifts them up. And in case you think hey! that's caricature, he now goes to another side. Those who are bedridden, in the name of Jesus, get up, get up, get up. And they stand up without prayer, without any testimony, without any testimony of stature, without reading any Bible verse. He showcases the excellency of God. And then I'm in that generation and I deceive myself that I've started. No, we have not started. We have not started. It takes a consciousness. He said, you are a choosing generation. A royal priesthood called to showcase the excellencies of God. So you are not called to live life. You are actually called to manifest God. It is in manifesting God that you attempt living life. If it is not the manifestation of the glory, the glory of God is the essence of God. So when he said you are called to showcase the glory of God, it means you came to manifest the excellency of God. There was a man called Daniel. He was in a nation where his own tribe were treated as slaves. But when they came, they looked upon him. He was fair to look upon. There was a glory he carried that in a whole nation, they could not but pick him out. And when they picked him out, they did not keep him in a class of geniuses. They did not keep him in a class of intelligent men. They placed him with witches, wizards, astrologers, enchanters, necromancers, men that had wisdom in the demonic realm. And the Bible said, this Daniel was ten times better than all of them until the king thought to make him the president of the realm. Meanwhile, you are in a class with lawyers and you say there is competition. You are in a class with medical doctors. You say there is competition. You are in a class with philosophers. You say there is competition. There is somebody of your clan that was put with witches, wizards, astrologers. He was ten times better than them because they say there is an excellent spirit in this Daniel. When the queen came to tell the records of Daniel, he said there is a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. When you see Christians gather, they gather begging to receive what they should command that we. Because our consciousness is wrong. When I knew it, I told myself, I have not started. I have not started. I have not started. I heard the story of A.A. Allen. He entered the city because his train broke down and he stepped down on the city. The moment he marched, the soil. He said every alcoholic in that city was cleansed. Because a man dropped from a tree. Meanwhile, we come from city to cities. We organize revival conferences. Even the people in the same meeting, they come back next week the way they are. And we are proud that things are happening. No. Our consciousness must be corrected. I heard of John G. Lake. He was in South Africa. In four years, he opened more than 1,200 churches, raised 
more than 900 pastors until a point came. He began to train some people. They call them healing technicians. These ones, they don't pray for people to be healed. They walk healing. They are called healing technicians. The way you have electricians that are technicians of electricity. They are men that are healing technicians. So when your bone break on your knee, they will hold your knee and tap it and push the bone inside. And when the bone doesn't want to enter, they will straighten your leg and they will tell the bone, bone becomes straight and your bone will obey. When he returned from South Africa to Spokane, they said Spokane is the healthiest city in the world of that time. Medical science came to a hold because one man entered the city. He sanctified the city of sickness. That's a God. We don't hear the exploits that men have done. That's why our consciousness is wrong. Meanwhile, I'm in a family. And darkness is having a few days. And I come out of that family, I say I'm an apostle. But somebody else in my lineage entered the whole city and he took over the city. How come? Because our consciousness is wrong. We are too quick to say we have done something. We are too quick to congratulate ourselves. We are too quick to clap hands for ourselves. That's why there are no buttons. There are no buttons. There are no buttons. When we should be crying, that's when we are celebrating. When we should be weeping, that's when we are celebrating. We say we have stature. And they bring one man, one man, to an apostolic convergence. That man is mad. And ten intercessors, we pray for three days. And one demon of madness, we sit down. Nobody can command him. And we go on the altar, we say we have stature. We should weep. We have not begun. We should cry. Because the people of the world know that when a God comes, he doesn't need to invite you. He said, John was in the wilderness. Yet, the whole of Jerusalem and Judea went to him. If a John comes into Abuja, he doesn't need a b-board. Somebody will tell somebody to tell somebody to tell you that somebody has come to town. So wrong that even the people of the world are making a ridicule of us. So wrong. The Bible said even creation knows when God appear. He said the endless expectation of creation it does not wait for apostles and prophets. It does not wait for teachers and evangelists. They waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. When a God enters Abuja even the trees we know the demons we know and the people of the world we know consciousness must be corrected you know you have judged yourself by the spectrum of another man's life that's why you are clapping you have been quick to judge yourself so you see somebody he comes for a meeting he says Jesus people fall down because you two people fall down now you say you have arrived even when they because there were certain men when they finished they didn't die they walked out of this world so there is a realm even beyond raising the dead a realm where a man comes for a conference like this and tells you God is telling me now that he wants to take me to heaven and you now be like ah he said Enoch told his generation that God will take him. It didn't happen to him by surprise. He told them God will take him. And Elijah came and told his servant, he said, today God will take me to heaven. The servant was like, what are you saying? He said, today I will leave earth today. It's not we now that we are going for mission in Congo and then we put there the whole world that we are going for mission. Meanwhile, before that time, Obadiah testified that the wind of the Spirit took him everywhere. The man came to a point where it became difficult for him to travel by vehicles. 
So he said, no, I won't go and tell the king. Before I come back, the wind of the spirit will carry you again. So they knew him. It was popular with him. And that was nothing. He bargained with God until a day came. He said, today God will take me. And Elisha didn't doubt because he knew who was talking. And he said, before God, whom I serve, I will not leave you today until I take a double portion of this anointing. And Elijah said, no, Kai, you have asked for a difficult thing. Here they bargain of spiritual men. You, you would think they are talking about money. They are talking about business. They are talking about inheritances in the spirit. I will go to heaven today. That's the discussion somebody is having with another man. And he said, you won't go until you give me a double portion of your anointing. He said, that thing you are asking for is difficult. But don't worry. If you see me when I'm taking, you will have it. That was the conversation. Meanwhile, when we will sit down now, what we are talking is, can you imagine what you have said? You have like this, said this, said that. And then for three months, we are building a hut around the malice, around the gossip. For three months, a whole people that God wants to entrust a generation to. For one year, they are talking about a gossip. That somebody said this, this one said this, this one said this. Meanwhile, in the realm of God, one man is saying, today I will go to heaven. The other man said, you will not go until I take a double portion. And he said, if you see me, you have it. And this same man, strode went to the other side. And when they were talking, he knew he had come to the place. And then he began to talk like an oracle. Oh, I wish I had access to that conversation. And while he was yet talking, the Bible said, a chariot of fire came from heaven and ran in between them because there had to be a separation between a God and a man. Running between them and the whirlwind took the man of heaven and he carried him to heaven. A whirlwind carried him. Even though Elisha was still a man, he was focused because he knew there's something this man knows. And when the man to fell, he caught it. He caught it. Forget all this garbage going on of an average life. You are not an average man. You are a carrier of the DNA of God. You are not a normal man. It doesn't matter where you are. You can be doing business. You are a God in that realm. You can be in ministry. You are a God in that realm. You can be in academia. You are a God in that realm. It's an error for the things that happen to men to happen to you. In this kingdom, things don't happen to us. We make things happen. You will see a small boy like this. And then you ask, how old is he? They will tell you he's 15 years old. And you say, what meeting is this? They are going to the national stadium. And you will come to the national stadium. You will expect Pastor Chris to walk out. And suddenly, you will see a boy of 15. And as he walks out, you will wonder, how able to gather this? Then you will hear, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou have ordained strength that thou might just silence the avenger. Very soon, you will see pictures on the internet. Cripples walking and you'll be looking for the man of God. But when you look closely, you will see a boy of 12 years raising cripple. And you say, where is the man of God? They will tell you, this is the man of God. That tiny boy you are seeing there is the man of God. Because there is a consciousness that the day has come. Today is the day of salvation. This is the hour where the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. And they that hear him shall live. That day has come. It will no longer be about white suits again. It will also be about white gowns. Because you will see ladies. Ladies. Elegant. Fair. Ladies. All of a sudden. Shattering people in stadiums. 
and you are wondering what's happening, they will tell you another enemy symptom and fasting has come. Another Catherine Kuman has come. And it will not just be Catherine Kuman, but a greater than Catherine Kuman will emerge. Do you know what you carry? Don't let any man make you an average person. Don't let any man make you a mediocre. Hear me. Hear me. And hear me well. In the days of revival, the unusual happens. And there are many men that will want to become gods over you. They will spread rumor. They will try to discredit you. Be focused. Don't bother about what men say. Carry your consciousness that you are a god manifesting to a generation and just born. When you born, after a while, your result will silence the accusation. to dematerialize. The time has come where men will command signs to appear in the constellations and they will happen. The time has come.
to do. Please lift your hands to whatever. There's about to be a paradigm shift. I know you are a mother. I know you don't have the title of an apostle or a prophet. But they say women receive their dead back to life. I know you were not ordained by any church. But they say some the word was not worthy for their name to be mentioned. They wondered, but they wondered with manifestations, signs, and wonders. They are men that defied the laws of this realm because of what they stepped into and what they came to understand. But sometimes God needs to give you a new one so that you can step out of what you know and step into what you don't know. Life so that you come water. out of the known and step into the unknown. I have your life of God in me. Life giving water. In the name of Jesus. There are 12 of you that are about to drink a new one. There is a heavy man too upon your life. From when you were young. There was nothing you could doubt. But now church has made you become an unbeliever. Your sad things, they happen. But you have lost them. There is a fresh impartation about to come upon you to activate that dimension. Ushers, this is your time. From the left to the right, from the front to the back, Receive that impartation. Jesus. A new wine. A new wine. Jesus. It's a new wine. Touch. Jesus. Sivinono. Sakabarakata la bragata balakata yana. Ejilanoga. 